you can easily show this. And so this is Gibbs uh, distribution or canonical ensemble. Now, here we have this defined by thermodynamics. What if we don't have it defined by something nice like thermodynamics? A lot of people will use an average, a sample average for that. Can you do that? Well, that's something I'm not going to get into. I'm going to leave that for the panel discussion. But that's a good question. If you assume that the sample average goes to infinity, then you might be OK. How close to infinity do you need to make this useful? Okay. The other thing is I use thermodynamics to get temperature for my beta. How do I get temperature? I take a thermometer and I measure something, right? But now we get into, well, isn't there uncertainty associated with that? So now you start getting this chicken and the egg problem. This is where I really want to emphasize. Now you would use for a parameter estimation problem, say, Bayes' rule, right? But then there's parts in Bayes' rule where you run into similar problems of context. You know, what do you start with? And this is, this is what we're going to see. I'm going to emphasize a couple of times of this chicken and the egg. And the solution I have is you just start and you go. And hopefully it's useful. And if it's not, you'll find out soon. A couple of things I want to mention about this derivation uh, for Gibbs's uh, uh, distribution. There's no mention of frequencies. Okay. We just determined the P that satisfies those constraints under the maximization condition. There's also, I didn't mention equilibrium. Now, it happens to be that if you're doing a problem with gas in a box and you use that particular information, it better be at equilibrium, otherwise you're going to get very wrong answers. But the point there is that the information I'm supplying is equilibrium information. It doesn't have to be equilibrium information. I can do a non-equilibrium problem if I supply non-equilibrium information. And that's a really key point. Also, there's no mention of ergodicity. In fact, uh, Gibbs got uh, kind of ferociously attacked for not mentioning, I think, uh, um, who did it? Uh, for attacked for not mentioning ergodicity in his work. He was kind of, I think, close to dying, so he, he couldn't s strum up a good uh, uh, defense. But, but uh, James mentions this uh, over and over to say he didn't need to mention ergodicity. There, there's no reason to mention it here. And the reason is, is because uh, his probability distribution describes the entire state of the system. So it allows for fluctuations, it allows for interactions, whereas Boltzmann doesn't. And this is the really damning point that, that just is not well known enough. And that is that Gibbs entropy is numerically equivalent to the thermodynamic, thermodynamic entropy. Boltzmann's is not. So although almost every textbook I read, when it talks about Boltzmann entropy being uh, equivalent to the thermodynamic entropy, uh, it, it, it's incorrect. It's Gibbs that's, that, that's, I think the only book I've ever read that mentions that is Tolman. Uh, but this is really important. And James is the one that pointed out. He figured out some cases where Boltzmann's entropy does, uh, fails, blows up. This is really critical because this really shows support for this methodology. So now we're going to get to Jane's. So in Jane's, I think his, came, his paper came out in 57. And uh, Jane's not only basically did what uh, uh, Berlewin did, but he also made the point of what I just said, and that is that this is a learning tool. Just because you use that entropy, Shannon's entropy in this case, to get Gibbs's distribution doesn't mean you're limited to gas in a box. You can get, you can use it for anything. It has no limitations on the information that you use. Of course, you want to use information that makes sense to use. You don't want to use information that's irrelevant to the problem. 
So you need relevant information. But the point is, uh, you can use this for all kinds of different things. And one of the things he did, which I think is much more significant than he's given credit for, and that is, he showed that if you don't have any, if the only constraint you have is the fact that all the probabilities have to sum to one, you're going to get a uniform distribution. This is also thought of, called the principle of indifference. Sometimes it's called the principle of insufficient reason, and the funny thing about that is, this is what Laplace called it, because he proposed this. It was called the principle of insufficient reason to knock Laplace. It, it, was, it was a negative term. So the idea is it's principle of insufficient reasoning, meaning he doesn't have sufficient reasoning. Right? So, so it's really a negative thing uh, against Laplace, but it just kind of caught on and you know, it's, like a, it's like a negative nickname. It just kind of catches on. Uh, but he called it principle of, uh, of, of indifference. And this is really critical because this is really one of the reasons why you have traditional statistics and Bayesian statistics today. Is because when Laplace was doing his work, he put in a uniform prior and said if the, if the prior is uniform, you get these solutions. And then a few people after him, like Boole, came in and said, well, that makes sense, but how do you prove that? I mean, you're just proposing that? You, know, you, you need to show that this is, this is correct. This is the correct way to do it. And then other people, like Venn, uh, just tried to destroy Laplace on this and said, this, this, this is absolutely wrong. And, uh, and then came uh, uh, Fisher, who was, who's really kind of considered the, the father of modern uh, statistical um, methods. Uh, and uh, it's funny because James really goes after Fisher and says, you know, he attacked, Vish, you know, he doesn't know what he's talking about. He attacked uh, Laplace and he had no right to do this. And uh, actually, Fisher uh, defended Laplace. In fact, Fisher was a student of Vin, and Vin viciously attacked Laplace. In fact, he wrote a book and he showed an example where Laplace's solution fails until his third version of the book, which it didn't have any, it didn't have that example anymore because Fisher told him he was wrong. So his student told the teacher he was wrong and that he would publish showing that Vin is wrong unless he took it out of his book. And that's why the third version doesn't have this example anymore. So Fisher actually supported uh, Laplace along with people like Boole and others, but again, it was the issue of who says you have this prior you have this weight on your likelihood. Who comes up with this? Why should you pick this among others? Of course, it works, but why should you do it? And so to me, this is absolutely a critical result from Jane's, is that this puts an end to that. This says if you do, if you use maximum uh, entropy to assign a probability uh, and you don't have any information, you get a uniform distribution. So this is really, really important, I, I think. And he doesn't get enough credit for it. So uh, that's kind of the, the end of most of the, of the historical part. So then I say end time passes. And the, now I want to get into a little bit of how entropy is used or misused in this case. So after Jane's, it was a big party. Entropy was the answer for everything. The whole solution, the evolution, biology, everything was entropy. And then this was what happened. It just disappeared because all these people that kind of jumped on the entropy bandwagon looked at it as disorder and things like this. And people said, especially the uh, ecologists and uh, biologists said, look, people are, you know, if you look at evolution, people are becoming more complex. They're not dissipating into nothing. So it doesn't make any sense. And it's because the people that were promoting entropy really didn't understand uh, the, the physical entropy of part. So then it kind of crashed, except for some people in Cambridge who used it properly as they knew it at the time and got really good results using entropy for image reconstruction. So I'm not going to go into this, but then even there, some things came up. So the results were good and still good. 
to, uh, uh, to an approximation, but then issues came up about uh, can you use entropy as a prior? How do you use entropy and connect it with Bayes and things like that? And that's where I'm going to leave that. So the next part of this is, can we talk about this a little bit? This connection of Bayes and Maxent. And so here's some things that probably a lot of people agree with, some statements. Are Bayes and Maxent simply two different methods to deal with different types of information? I think that's the predominant view. If you have constraint type information, you use that. Machine learning people certainly use that in a semi-inappropriate way because they use sample averages for, uh, for their constraints, for their, their uh, expectation values. And Bayes deals with data. That's what I learned when I first uh, got involved in it. The next thing is that Maxent is an optimization method. It's designed to choose the most honest distribution based on constraints. Example, assigning uh, or creating a prior. This is certainly what James pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed. Can you, uh, Maxent is the way to assign a probability when you don't know anything else or you, you know their constraint information. You don't have a likelihood yet. You don't have a prior. How do you come up with this prior? So that's the problem. This is, again, the chicken and the egg problem. In Bayesian, statistic, uh, Bayesian inference, you need a prior. How do you come up with the prior? Jane said, use Maxent. But as we saw earlier, how do we come up with the expectation value? Got to use Bayes. <laughs> And so this is where the chicken and the egg problem comes up. Bayes rule is an updating method where one has some information a priori and uses new information to come to a different conclusion with the prior R1. OK, a little, little typo there. But it basically comes to a different conclusion uh, than the prior. So you have your prior. You gain some new information. You shouldn't still think that the prior is correct. You've got new information. It's got to go somewhere, right? And so you have to change your mind. So this is the idea of the, the, the degrees of belief. This is the idea of updating. I thought one way. Now I think a different way. One key thing I want to emphasize here is the difference between these two ideas, that Maxent is an optimization method. It's not updating at least from Jane's point of view and many, many people's point of view. It's not updating. You have a problem, you're looking for a probability distribution that maximizes a particular functional based on some information, right? Bayes' rule deals with data. I am gaining information in the form of data. I had a belief, now I have a new one. This is the next question in the panel group. Are they compatible? How are they connected? It's a big question. I'm going to try to answer part of that in this talk. So here's an example I pulled off the web in a big, long blog of discussion of people going back and forth, back and forth. And this is going to kind of, I'm going to hopefully illustrate why the blog shouldn't be 10,000 pages long, it should be three lines long. And what they do is they say, okay, I'm going to present you the problem. I have a die, a six-sided die, and I'm told that the average I should get off that die is 3.5 dots. Now, I want to mention something here is that sometimes they say, well, you can't have 3.5 dots. Well, the dots are, are a weight. You know, you have, if you roll a six, you get six dots. All right. You can't have half a dot, but you can certainly have an average of dots. And so 3.5, I don't have a problem with. So then, it's a misuse and misunderstanding of what an expectation is, and not what you expect to get, like a 3 or a 5. And then, you find out, after you know this first piece of information, that x is an odd number. How do you determine what the probability is of getting a 1 or a 2 or a 3 or a 4 or a 5 or a 6? 
So what this particular example did is it said, okay, for the max sense solution, well, I know that x is an odd number, so I'm not even going to bother with i's that are even, 2, 4, 6. So I'm going to limit myself to one side, three, the three side, and the five side, and then I'm going, to do, I'm going to maximize this probability and try to come up with a solution based on this information. So based on these two pieces of information, you get this. Then what they said, well, in a Bayesian solution, if I started with this, this must mean that the distribution is uniform. And then I get x as an odd number. So the idea is I start with a uniform prior, and then my posterior is only told that it, x is an odd number. So therefore, 1, 5, and 3 have to all have the same probability. And there's all kinds of problems why this is completely wrong. Yes? I, I see that the other typo is in that first line. That should be 0 0.32. Oh, yeah, sorry. 0 0.32. <laughs> and yeah, and 0 0.47. Yeah. You know, I was taking up too much space, so I tried to make it percentages, and I thought, nah, I don't like that, so I went back, and then I screwed it all up. So yes, 0 0.22, 0 0.32, and 0.47, thank you. The reason this is wrong is because the logic is wrong, how it's used, all right? First of all, max int doesn't do then. Then would imply an update. You get something, then you get something else. In maxint, there is no then. If you get this piece of information, you maximize the entropy. If you get, have both these pieces of information, you maximize the entropy. If this no longer applies, you don't use it. You use this. This is the traditional way to use maxint. Okay? Here, for the Bayesian solution, he assumes, this person assumes, I and mean, this is a common example. This person assumes that just because the average indicates that all the probabilities are weighted the same, that somehow uh, you should use that for, for, for a, a normal prior. And, and, that, and, that, and that doesn't make any sense. The other thing I want to also mention is that when you get these numbers, Bayes doesn't give you a number. Bayes gives you a distribution. So how do you get a number? Something like maybe maximum likelihood is a good, good way to go. If you, have a uni if you, have a, you maximize the posterior, if the, if the prior is uniform, then the maximum of that would be the maximum likelihood method. Because you're looking for a parameter, a number, but you don't know which number you should pick. And so you look for the number that gives you the maximum probability. So this is, yes? Something I'm just confused about. It seems like we're looking at two different problems because the Bayesian solution there yeah. does not have expectation value of x equal to 3.5. Right. So in one problem, you're trying to satisfy both constraints and in the other, yeah. you're not. But yeah. Well, they're both, they're, they're both trying to satisfy both the, the, both the, both the uh, constraints. Uh, and the, this one is trying to use this as a prior piece of information in the Bayesian solution. But it's exactly this point that I'm trying to make. There are two different problems. Yet, this, I see this all the time. That folks will say, well, here's the Bayesian solution. And here's if I use maximum entropy. So clearly, maximum entropy is wrong. This occurs all the time. And the reason it's wrong is because it's a different problem. It's a solution to a completely different problem that they're choosing. And this may seem very trivial the way I pointed out, but <laughs> I see it all the time. And now I just saw another paper that came out, and I'm going to go to another example. And this example, it's a little more interesting. This example says, okay, I have a die, a six-sided die, and the, the, uh, the information I have is that the average is five, but I also have information that I only, have, I only got that five out of two throws. So I'm using a sample average with only two throws. 
So right there, you, you have some issues. But we'll forego those issues for right now. Now, if that's the case, here is my constraints that I would use for maximum entropy, just like the previous problem. But we know that there are only two possible outcomes for, for instance, to get a five. Either you get two fives, or you get zero fives and you get one four and one six. That's the only way two throws are gonna make up five. So this person who, who was very diligent in calculating this, to me makes the same mistake, only it's a little bit harder to, to pick up. And what they do is they say, okay, for the Bayesian solution, you would use a multinomial, they use, uh, I think, some um, uh, truth tables, but it's basically you see this symmetry, that the, that, that, that the five is, is twice as likely to come up than the, than the four or the six. This is what they, they were referring to as old throws. In other words, I'm not making any new throws. I'm just taking what's already there. What's the probability of that I had a five or that I had a four and a six? That's where they come up with that. And then they say, okay, now I want to talk about a new throw, which is what you're usually concerned with. In other words, I have this information. Now in my next throw of the die, what should I expect to see? And they have some solution that is very close to this, and you see this kind of sy symmetry over here with the four and the five and the six. It's a little bit higher than the one, the two, and the three. So now this can be anything, right? This isn't limited to your prior population. This can be anything now, right? One, two, three, four, five. And this is the solution. Now, nowhere except for the fact that they know this piece of information and this piece of information, do they come up with this because they know that there are only two possible outcomes. And for the, cur for the old throw, from in other words, before you throw it again, you know that the, the first three probabilities must be zero for that population. And that's fine. Then they use maximum entropy, and this is where the trouble starts. For this example, I'm going to blow this section up a little bit, because this is where a, a, a real key part of using maximum entropy that I'm going to use later on when I start uh, uh, making it a little bigger uh, comes in. And that is that essentially for the dice problem, you make F11, F22, F33, F44. But what these are really are labels or weights of what the probability is compared to the other probabilities. All right? And this is really important to understand that it's not just there's one dot, two dots, three dots. Those dots that you put in here, one, two, three, four, five, six, what you're really doing, what you're really constraining is what the probabilities are in relation to each other. And that's a really, really critical point. So you use the, the distribution that we had in the previous case. It doesn't change. The maximum entropy method still gives you the same uh, form. But now what they say is in the old throw, you're going to get a uniform distribution. You know one, two, and three can't be correct. And, uh, and because you have only this number, and you maximize based only on that number and the fact that P1, P2, and P3 have to be zero, you get a uniform distribution between four, five, and six. Well, of course you do. You're not putting in information that they put into the Bayesian solution. It's a different problem again. What is the information that you're not putting in here? You're not putting in how the distribution is weighted. If you put in uh, four, five, and six, you're telling us something about the distribution. You can't just willy-nilly put that in, all right? The second one they do is they say well, the max set in the next in a new throw max cent solution will give you this well first of all in the classical uh, max cent there is no new throw there is no updating it's just an assignment so now if you include the fact that the probabilities uh, for p1 p2 and p3 now can be something other than zero and you use this expectation value and maximize it and put in one, two, three, four, five, and six in there, you're going to get this solution. And the author says, which is clearly wrong. 
because it's not to the Bayesian solution. Well, guess what? Again, it's a different problem. You didn't put in the same information here that you put in to the Bayesian solution. And that is this symmetry about what makes up five. What makes up that, what are the possibilities that make up that average five? If you want to include some symmetrical arguments, you change the weights. I could make this one, two, one, and I'm going to get something that look here, I'm not going to get something that looks uniform, I'm going to get something that looks like the Bayesian solution. Now the question is, okay, do you just arbitrarily change things? How do you change things? How do you do that? Because it's certainly not what Maxent was intended originally for. So this is why I want to discuss is, is how to do this. But the point of this is, I just saw this, th this is a very recent paper from somebody that uh, is quite knowledgeable on the subject and still these mistakes are made. This claim that it doesn't work and I'm putting in the same information. That's why I showed that definition of probability in the beginning. Okay? You're going to come up with different probabilities if you have different information, by definition. Forget the method that you're using. Okay, so let's go to a more interesting problem. I think inter more interesting. Now we want to know the probability of a die, and in this case it's going to be a three-sided die just because it's easier for me to do computationally. <laughs> uh, you have a three-sided die, and the average of this die is 2.3, in this case, you know how many ones and twos and threes came up. So in this case, what we're doing is we're saying, someone is telling me, I have this expectation value. Where it comes from, I'm not gonna get into it this right this second, but it's gonna come up later. I just have this information, wherever it came from. But I also know that I rolled the die 20 times, and this is the distribution, this is the, this is the uh, frequency of the ones, the twos, and the threes I got. So now how do you put this information in uh, all together? So I say to be continued because now I'm gonna make a nonlinear jump in time and go to cool back. How am I doing in time? Uh, 15 minutes. 15? Well, until you're full out. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, I better get a little move on here. Okay, so I'm going to go back to Kulbach. Now Kulbach came out with his discrimination or mean discrimination. So he called this part, the log of P over Q, his discrimination. And he called the P log of this as his mean discrimination. Those are his words. All other words like cross entropy, um, uh, everything else is attributed to somebody else. This is what he said. Okay, in fact, he even mentioned this later on. Uh, that this is, this is what he said, and everybody else kind of took his ball and ran with it. Now, the interesting thing here is this came out uh, in uh, 51, before James. But what Kulbach was interested in, not updating, he was looking for a measure that compares this guy with this guy, okay? Just a measure, right? How do you compare this object with this object? That's what he wanted. Right? Now this is important because then Jane's paper came out and said, well, if you use Shannon's entropy and you do all these great things and you maximize it and, and, and uh, 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 the other guys, uh, you get this great result. Then Kulbach wrote a book and said, oh yeah, uh, th this is, a, this is a, a prior and this is a posterior. And if you minimize this object, uh, you get what Jane's got. And that's pretty much all he said. So it's kind of like, oh yeah, yeah, what he said. That, that works too. But he really didn't show why should you do that. What, what you know, this is just a principle that he created. And, and people have used it forevermore. Uh, some people who were uh, interested in, okay, that makes sense. We like that idea. James himself said, well, if you want to go to a continuous limit, you have to put in some kind of invariant measure here because you can't, you, you can't just have a, a nothing there for the continuous limit. But he was very adamant. This is not a prior. We're not updating here. This is assigning probabilities. And I really want to emphasize these words, assigning 
optimization, updating, because I really think there's a lot of confusion with how they're, how they're used. Because even James will say, how do you, if you ask him, how do you get that information, you would say, well, that's a priori information. <laughs> so that sounds like prior information, right? But it's not a Bayesian prior, and that's the, the key thing, is I think what he meant. But I don't think it was clear that he meant this is not a Bayesian prior, but it's still prior information. This is, this is, a, this is something you start with, right? Sean and Johnson, later on, tried to say, okay, Kulbach came up with this. He came up with this minimization principle. He has no justification for it whatsoever. Maybe we can try to come up with some justification similar to the way Shannon did it. And so they created a set of axioms and tried to show that you can, do, you can derive this based on the axioms. And it was criticized. There were some issues with the axioms. Other people that I have to mention too uh, was uh, Gull and Skilling worked at, tried to give a definition of this in their kangaroo argument. And more recently, uh, uh, Kevin Knuth and John Skilling have been doing uh, much more uh, work in regards to entropy and uh, where it comes from, why, does it, why should it be that entropy, and so on. Well, what do you mean? What do you yeah. mean derive this? It's, it's, a, it's a figure of merit. So that's my figure of merit. And how do you derive my figure of merit? The, der the, der the derivation is that if you're going to use this as a minimization principle, what gives you the right to do that? Why should that be correct? So yeah, you can write whatever you want. I mean, you can just write down and say this is the definition. But why should you use that as a minimization principle? Why should you use that entropy instead of another one to come up with inference, to do inference? And that's what Shore and Johnson were interested in. Not from the measure point of view, but for inference. Yeah. And then the times pi is what's the expectation I'm going to see that bit length. Yeah. The so log qi is like what's the bit length going to be if I use the wrong model? Because yeah. A prior sim model. So yeah. The difference of those entries. Yeah. So but it has nothing to do with inference, though. It has to do with measure. Right. Right. The figure of merit then it makes sense without derivation. Sure. And 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 in, and in fact and in fact I would go farther than that and say uh, that's what. Uh, 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 Kulbach's 1951 paper was, was to say, this is what you should use for a measure. And there's all kinds of issues related to measure and all kinds of stuff, so I'm not going to get into that. Thank you. But this is what I want to get to. So, so this is coming back to that problem I suggested before. So this is an econometric problem. Uh, I pulled this right out of, uh, of a paper I'm showing down here. All right? And it kind of refers to this problem I, I showed earlier, and I said, you know, I'm going to come back to it. And that's, this is how they describe it. Let x be a random variable that takes three outcomes. They, they call these types, uh, 1, 2, and 3, with probabilities p1, p2, p3, that are unknown. The sample size is some gigantic number, and the average is 2.3. So whatever this infinite population is, you know somehow that the average of that infinite population is 2.3. Okay, fine. But the sample is unknown. So you don't know how you got that, that there. Now you take a smaller sample. So now you draw something from these types. And you draw 20 of these things. And this is your frequency that you draw. You get, a, you get 11 ones of this type, 11 of this type, 2 of this type, and 7 of this type. Okay. Use these frequencies as estimates of your probability and proceed to, t to determine what the probability is. They call this large deviation because this, these frequencies deviate quite a bit from this average. In other words, the average of these frequencies are, are, are very far away from this. And this is, the, this is polarized. So this I'm just putting on there to show that there's some mathematics involved in all this. This is straight out of um, 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 Cover and Thomas. And the key points that I want to get to are that they use this and basically minimize it to get something like this. And this is my uh, line slash like Arial here. And this is what I want to get to. And this is what they use. And this is straight out of Cover and Thomas. And what they do is they say, OK, Q I'm going to use as my prior, which is these frequencies of my data. And then I want to determine what the estimate of the true P is right here. 
Well, again, I want to emphasize this idea of the true P. What is the true P? And Ariel even said, you know, that it gets closer to the true P. I don't know how you can get, how you can judge if you're closer to something that you have no idea what it is. So I wanted to pick on them a little bit there. But anyway, the point here is, uh, this is what they do. They put those, those frequencies in there and they come up with these numbers. Boom, boom, boom. End of story. Now, I want to come up with a different solution than that. Yes? So in, in the, the previous solution, yeah. was this looking, is P star the distribution subject to the constraint that has the minimum relative entropy with the data? Right. So, they're gonna, so what they're doing is minimizing this object. This is the solution of that minimization. And then they come up with beta comes from the uh, sample mean. And in this case, that's precisely maximum likelihood, right? I think that, that is what minimizes the constraint relative. Um, let's talk offline about it, but I have yeah. limited time, so. Um, sorry? What's the minus? The typo. Oh, little typo. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, those typos will kill you, especially uh, uh, that kind of typo. So anyway, sorry about that little typo. Um, anyway, so this is the solution. So what I want to do is I want to come up with a solution uh, that is what I would call a Bayesian solution. And so I want to start with the entropy. I want to start with the proper entropy. And the proper entropy in this case is really a dual space, thetas and x's. And this guy here, I'm going to call the prior, and I'm going to use the product rule to separate that up. This is a traditional Bayesian prior. This is a traditional Bayesian likelihood. And if you maximize that, thank you, if you maximize that based on these constraints, you get this solution. See this delta function? When you have data, when you observe data, it's a delta function. X is one number. It can't be any other number. There's been arguments that said, well, you can't use delta functions. That's too constraining. I don't know how much less constraining you can get than observation. You can't unobserve something. It is what it is, regardless if there's uncertainty. And you can put uncertainty in here. You don't have to use a delta function. You can put uncertainty into your measurement. But right here, I'm assuming that I know exactly what I just observed without uncertainty. You'd actually get uh, 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 a Jeffrey's uh, you can, uh, uh, Jeffrey's solution instead of the Bayesian solution. Anyway, maximize that. You get this object here. If I sum over all the x's, I get this solution, which is exactly Bayes' rule. So the first thing to show here is that using entropy, I reacquire Bayes' rule. Now, one comment might be, well, I'm using the product rule over there. Ah, but Bayes' rule is not the same as product rule. And this is why. Product rule can be rewritten to get what we would call Bayes' theorem. Thetas and x's. But the product, but, but, but the, the product rule alone doesn't choose which x. You, know, you observe the x. How does the, x, how does, how does the space of x's become your observation? There's no formal mechanism, although it's used that way. There's no formal mechanism that shows that. Okay. And if that seems strange, I can, I can go back uh, to some other slides to show that. But anyway, that's not my point here. But this is Bayes' rule. But now I can not only use this data value, but I can also use this constraint information. And when I maximize using those two constraints, I get this solution. If I don't have any data, this drops out, this drops out, this drops out. I have the maximum entropy solution. If I have data and I don't have any other constraints except the data, then I get the Bayesian solution. If I have both, I get a unique solution that includes both those pieces of information. So to solve that problem that, was, that, that, was, that Sanov's uh, theorem was used for, first thing is, what's my likelihood? It's multinomial. Second thing is, and this is important why I emphasized this in the, in previously, this, can, this, this average information I have, what does it really mean? It really means that I'm putting a weight 
on the expectation values for what the probability of getting a 1, getting a 2, or getting a 3 is. And that there's this relationship. And this is the proper way to write it. And when I do that, put it all into my distribution, solve for my betas and everything else, I get this solution, which is a lot, which is very close to, uh, uh, to the Sanov uh, solution. And in fact, when I wrote this paper, that's the reply I got back was, well, so what? It's close enough, isn't it? <laughs> well, first of all, these are means that I'm taking from a distribution that has uncertainty. These are numbers. How, clo how, how close is this number? How sure are you of this number? You could do the standard deviation of your frequency, but that's certainly not the standard deviation of the entire sample. So if you want to do this properly, use the Bayesian solution, use the maximum entropy solution, which is, is, is all the same. This is being used in a lot of different applications right now. I've used it in ecology. People are using it for complex, or uh, we've used it for complex materials. Structural health monitoring is a big area where this is being used right now. This is a pro there's a problem with structural health monitoring because you have very little data. Got it. Very little data. So you only have a couple of data points. But you have great constraint information. And so with very little data, you can, you can converge on a solution very quickly. This is where I'm interested in doing it. When you have overwhelming amounts of data, what do you, you can't process all the data. What do you do with it? I'd suggest converting some of that data into uh, different kinds of constraints. So this is, gets into an approximation. And this is the, the, one of the, la the two, second to the last slide. And that is that you can't process them all simul uh, sequentially. Bayesian solutions are sequential updating, right? Every time you add a new piece of data, it's sequentially updated. Update, 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 every time you get a data point. With Maxent, that constraint that you have in the beginning holds always. So sometimes there's a, there's a characterization, of, characterization of Maxent that says, well, uh, Maxent never gives up on that constraint. There's no data. It's always true. Yes, but if you use Bayes, the likelihood is that also a very hard constraint. You might be collecting data, but your family of distributions you're going to get are always going to be dependent upon that likelihood. It's not like it's going to turn into some other distribution the more data you get. You start with a Gaussian or something like that, right? So if you process sequentially, what you're really doing is you're saying, uh, this constraint holds. Now, such as a prior, now I'm getting new information. So this constraint no longer holds. And I'm going to go to my new constraint over here. This is sequential. If you do them both simultaneously, you arrive at a spot that's very different than if you would have done it sequentially. This, isn't not, this is not a big deal in Bayes, but it is a very big deal if you use the method I just uh, used, which is the entropy method. And so I want to end here with what I am calling a principle of inference. This idea of updating, assigning, optimization methods, uh, a family of distributions, all these things I think can be reworded into basically three points. You just do away with this idea of updating, of assigning, all these words that I think confuse, priors, all right? First part of the principle, do what you want. Just do it consistently. Because if you're consistently wrong, you're going to die out. And the consistently right people are going to be successful. So do whatever you want to do. Just do it, do it consistently, all right? This to me is why, this is probably the greatest paper I think I ever read was by Cox, because he was so subtle about this point. Uh, when you get new constraints, information, decide which old ones still hold. For all those that still hold, when you get information, so I have information, I get new information, if both those pieces of information hold, they should need to be processed simultaneously. They both have to hold, right? For those that don't hold anymore, don't throw them away, but process the new, one, the new ones sequentially. This is essentially the updating argument, right? So this is essentially the assigning argument, and this is the updating argument, but it's really quite simple. 
keep the information you want. When you no longer want certain parts, you leave it to the side. You don't throw it away. Just leave it to the side and go in your new direction. Future of Maxent is going to be discussed at the panel. And this is the third question on the panel. Thank you very much. Nice lot to think about. Yeah. There. <laughs> uh, okay, first question over here. I have one historical question, one historical remark. So maybe regarding the remark, uh, you talked about the disappearance of uh, of updating via relative entropy mm, and. Uh, that it was proposed by Kohlberg, and later there was kind of emptiness uh, in the dark, and uh, Shore and Johnson paper appears. So I think it's worth to note that uh, somewhere in the well, in the sec second part of the 60s, uh, there were several works by Chensov, who actually shown that for the relative entropy, you have kind of Pythagorean theorem. Which, uh, when, which provides the projection up the, on the subsets under minimization. And in the sense it provides, uh, when put in the context of information geometry, it provides kind of very nice um, justification why it should be used. So it's not that Shaw Johnson provided first um, uh, reason for using relative entropy as a principle of dating. It's, it's, uh, at least uh, since late 60s. OK, can I interject there? Are you, are you talking about Bayesian probabilities? Mm, no, I'm speaking about probabilities. Ah, see, that's where we would differ. OK, because there's Cesar's work. Mm -hmm. Shannon shows up in Cover and Thomas, and they go from measures to sets to types and arrive at Shannon's entropy, which is not the way he did it. And it's important the way, the reason it's not the way he did it, because of, he thought of, I need something that works, now I want to make a mathematical formalism to do that work. Whereas that gets lost if it's, you look at it purely mathematical. And as we see from Sanoff's theorem, because Sanoff's theorem comes from method of types, those are frequencies. They're not, they're not probabilities, as has been discussed in many of the talks already. So you have Cesar, who basically uses uh, goes, off, goes from cool back, right? But what are the probabilities? Are they probabilities or are they frequencies? Okay, I, I get the point. Yep. Okay, so the question is, uh, what is uh, the particular technical difference between the, uh, because apparently there was kind of result of Williams at 1980 on yeah. this derivation of, of Bayesian updating from relative maximum entropy. I, I'm, I would like to know what is the technical difference between those derivation by you and Arguello if, and... If, if you can show me his derivation, I mean, I have the paper. If you can so show I, I, I couldn't get it, so that's my, that's my if, question. If, if you can show me in his paper where the derivation is, then I'll, I'll, I'll give him absolutely full credit and take my name off all our papers. So what is the actual, the first well, he uh, hints about it in the paper. He strongly hints that this seems to be the way you should do things. He even mentions, I think, the delta, but it's, it's, it's a hint. He doesn't actually do it. And so one of the things I didn't have time to show was that we actually start with a set of axioms like Shaw and Johnson and derive that functional form. And that's really important. It's not like we're just taking cool back and doing what we want with it, right? We're saying, we're doing what Shannon did and said, okay, what kind of function do we want? What do we want to do with this? And then we proceed to come up with a formalism. Yes, and that's the big difference. We're advancing this uh, all the time. And I think this particular one had better go offline because we're short yeah, of time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Another question? No, that's fine. Uh, I just uh, have a short uh, comment about four Maxent meetings ago, I presented a talk where I identified uh, the flaws in Shannon's derivation and Shaw and Johnson's derivation. So neither Shannon's entropy nor the kullback libraries distance is what they're claimed to be. None sure. of them is unique. None of them is characterized by the axioms that people believe they are. Unique in the sense that, that you get a family of entropies, like Rainy entropy? You entropies? get family, yeah. Yeah. Actually, you don't get entropies, you get distances. OK. Well, show us where our flaw is, that and I appreciate will, it. That's something that will be c coming up later in the conference, I promise you. <laughs> uh, one more, I think, yeah. 
No, I don't. I just wanted to make a comment about Laplace's principle of indifference or principle of insufficient reason, mm -hmm. which has been misunderstood ever since he proposed it. Well, ever since the guy called it the principle of insufficient reason. It's <laughs> not, followed that. you don't, he, his principle, you, you don't come up with one over M in your case because there are only M possibilities and you use entropy and then you find, because you insert no information, you come up with one over M. Hmm. The reason is Laplace said there's insufficient reason to believe in the probability of causes. And when you average over all causes with a uniform distribution, you get one over M. That's a completely different derivation than the principle of indifference, which says there are only M statements in the state space, therefore, by applying maximum entropy, I get one over M. So it's very, very important to distinguish the correct usage of what Laplace said, and it's not what you said there. Numerically equivalent? No, only for the very first case. For example, okay. Laplace said if you toss a coin 100 times, the probability of getting ahead is uh, 101, mm -hmm. 1 over 101. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you fix the probability of 1 over m, then use the binomial theorem to find the probability in, of heads in 100 tosses. So you find the distinguishing characteristic when you look at more than one toss. On the first one, yes, they're the same, but you got there for different, completely different mathematical reasons. That's fine. I didn't claim that it was it, that that's what Laplace did or that was the definition. I claim that that's a very good reason why you should use a uniform distribution and supports Laplace's idea of using a uniform distribution. I agree. I think this is showing your wisdom, Adam, in having a panel discussion on this <laughs> later on so that we can take this and give, the, give it the time it deserves. I think we should now thank Adam for his talk. And we'll try to make up a little bit of time by trying to get back here at 3.05. Meanwhile, we have a break. Hey, Adam. Hey, Julian. Hey, I sent you an email a couple of times. I never, got, I never heard back from you. Oh, really? I, I don't know. You had like a couple of different emails, so sometimes I'm... I 